Father, as we look at your word, touch us. Lord, as we look at your word, change us. Lord, as we look at your word, let us see the bigger picture. Let us see your picture. In the name of Jesus. Amen. But welcome, Corinthians. Do you know how long it took you to convince yourselves that you were Corinthians last Sunday and it's not embedded in you seven days later? Hello, Corinthians! Okay, for those that weren't here at uh, last week's teaching, uh, we started uh, the letter of 1 Corinthians. Um, when we look at sometimes the Bible, I've heard people say it before, oh, it doesn't apply to us today. Well, when we actually looked at Corinth, the city to whom Paul was writing to the church that was part of, we noticed that the city... It's social makeup, it's, uh, it's, it's values, and what it does is absolutely no different from Greenford. I wouldn't say it's prosperous, but what it is, it's, has, uh, it's made of uh, different religions. It's very cosmopolitan, lots of different nationalities. It is absolutely obsessed with status, self-promotion, and personal rights. So, hello, Corinthians. Good, we're with you. Right, here we go. I'm going to turn this on. So, yes, hopefully, wonderful, we'll be able to show some of the Bible verses up on the screen. So, beyond the fact we learnt we are Corinthians, what also did we learn? What's the one of the key things, things I really want us to hang on to? Well, there's two things, ultimately. We'll get to the third thing later in, uh, in months to come. But what's the key thing we learnt last week? What was the other key thing? Chris. Was it that they want to take on any new truth and incorporate it into what True, they could take on any new truth. They were very um, uh, Corinth liked impressive, well spoken teachers. That's absolutely true. And we reflected on these days people who have good rhetoric, good way of teaching, seem to know what they're talking about. But there was one key thing. Beloved of God. Beloved of God, which is therefore then you're on the right track. We are God's own possession. Remember that word that Paul used about being holy, sanctified? It is now, present tense. You are sanctified now. And the fact that a lot of you couldn't remember that means we haven't learned it yet. So we're going to keep going on until we get there, Okay. Yeah, we were going to do it anyway. Oh, come on, get cheerful. We've been waiting for this for months. Those who are not members of this church, many, um, our Bibles, unfortunately, have got to a, a very state of disrepair. But we knew we also needed to change the translation. And it was discussed years, years some time ago at a members meeting that we would have the New Living Translation and we'll try and display it on the screen. And we're finally halfway there. Because the idea is it's meant to be displayed over the moving image. But uh, there you go. So we're there. So let's read uh, 1 Corinthians verses 4 to 9. We'll continue. I always thank God for you and for the gracious gifts he has given you now that you belong to Christ Jesus. Through him, God has enriched your church in every way with all of your eloquent words and all your knowledge. This confirms that what I told you about Christ is true. Now you have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be free from all blame on the day when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. God will do this for he is faithful to what he says. Sorry, he is faithful to do what he says. And he has invited you into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. That whole section, and please bear with me this morning, because obviously we've not done this before, so I might miss going back to the verses. You'll have to just take my word for it on some of it. But that section is status confirmation again about being God's own possession. In a weird way, and you think, why? Well, it's all about Jesus. 
It's about God. If you read over those, those five verses, everything about it is about Jesus. God. Everything. Not one bit of it in that section is really about us. It's all primarily about him. Everything. Let me just go back over it again. See if you can see this. Through him, that's not you, God has enriched your church in every way. With all your eloquent words. No, I've missed one, haven't I? Yep. I thank, always thank my God for you and for the gracious gifts he has given you now that you belong to Christ Jesus. Notice God is the primary, Jesus is the end. Through him, God has enriched, through Jesus, God has enriched your church in every way with all of your eloquent words and all of your knowledge. This confirms what I told you about Christ is true. Now you have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be free from all blame on the day when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. God will do this for he is faithful to what he says. And he has invited you into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Everything actually is done by God through Jesus You've done nothing, Corinthian church. So everything is primarily about Jesus and what he does. So when we talk about us being God's own possession, it's not because of how great we are. Anybody feeling great right now? No, that's the problem, we don't. But we are God's own possession because of what he has done. Now, this whole thankfulness section here that Paul has done is, um, sorry, I've just remembered something I've not got sat in front of me, which would be really helpful right now, but we can sort that later. Um, this whole thing is, is a standard thankful section. It's a way of thanking, uh, it's a standard letter that they would do in the Hellenistic Greek period, in a way of thanking somebody for who they are and what they're about. If you look at something like 1 Thessalonians, could you turn to that if you've got a Bible? This is what I've realised I've not got. I've not got a Bible on my lectern. But if you'd like to turn to 1 Thessalonians in whichever version you have. It's always good, isn't it, when the teacher doesn't have the Bible? I wished it was in my head. Um, if you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And you got there where Paul, I think in about verse 3 onwards, is thanking the Thessalonian church for who they are. Would somebody like to read that bit to us, please? Belinda, thanks. Yes, that's fantastic. We continually remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you. That's perfect. That will do. Thank you. Have you noticed that? Who's Paul thanking? At the end, but was he thanking them for? Their work, what they're doing, what the church is doing, how they're applying their gifts. Now go back to 1 Corinthians. I always thank, God, thank my God for you and for the gracious gifts he has given you. Note, God's given them gifts. Through him, God has enriched your church in every way with all of your eloquent words and all of your knowledge. But that's not about them growing. Just saying, you've got these gifts. This confirms what I told you about Christ is true. Now you have every spiritual gift you, you need as you eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be free from all blame on the day when our Lord Jesus returns. God will do this for he is faithful. You notice it. Not once has he actually said to him, for the love that you're doing. If you look at 1 Thessalonians, for what you are doing out there, for how you are growing. And it's the same in 2 Thessalonians and all Paul's letters. He's thanking the other churches 
for what they are doing, how they're applying what they know and the gifts that they have got. Here in the 1 Corinthians, he isn't saying that at all. He's thanking God for what God has given them. But he's not thanking God and for what they are doing with it. There is a very subtle difference, but it is very much there when you read it. Notice this letter, as much as I go on, that we are God's own possession. This letter is Paul rebuking and correcting the Corinthians. If you remember, the primary reason for the letter wasn't just about unity of the church, but it was also to tackle the greed, the idolatry, the sexual immorality that was in the church. No wonder Paul is not giving them any thanks for their growth. They've got caught up in their own world values, their own city's values. It's quite a key greeting. He's thanking God for everything but it's not how they're using the gifts that God has given them. He said, God's given you it all, but you're not using them. That's the subtle underplay. And that carries on through the rest of the letter. God likes us to use the gifts that he's given us. Is there a subtle amen? Or is there an uncomfortableness? It's no good us having gifts and talents and skills if they're not being put to full use both inside here within Greenford Baptist Church, but also out there. If we're not putting them to use, we could get a letter like this from Paul. In verses five to six, gosh, this is slow, isn't it? Through him, God has enriched your church in every way with all your eloquent words and all your knowledge. Now that verse really looks like he's saying, you've got fantastic words and you've got amazing knowledge. What is the city of Corinth well known for? It's mighty fine traveling speakers. No, not me. I just deliberately stand there grinning, waiting for somebody to make that comment. They want to peddle their knowledge. They like to believe that because they speak so well, they know everything. So what do you think a church living in its society might accidentally fall into the trap of wanting? The ability to have eloquent words and fantastic knowledge. One of the key things within church we've always got to be cautious of is, you know, when we say we've got to go against the world, but we do live in the world's culture and we use the message to display God's word. We use the culture of our today to spread God's word in whichever format. Do we use the language of today to try and relate God's gospel? Yes. But we can fall into the trap of then thinking, well, we need to sound exactly like them and have everything that they have. And we go grasping that rather than grasping God. So what Paul is getting at here very quickly, is that he is saying that actually you might want to sound like you're talking about. So as he's writing this letter, he's saying, so you have eloquent words and knowledge. What would a church say when they see that letter from the Apostle Paul? Oh, yes, we've got those. Remember, this is eventually coming a letter that's rebuking them and telling them off. So he's building them up slightly. Do you remember right at the beginning in verse 1, he has to affirm his status as an apostle. He has to tell him, I am here by Jesus Christ's will. It's a God-given gift. I am appointed as the apostle, as the church leader, by God. He has to affirm his status because they're so hell-bent. That's the wrong phrase, isn't it? Oh, well. They're so absolutely robust in the idea of actually, oh, if he's a good speaker, he's got good status. So he's saying, okay, so the church will go, yes, yes, we've got those gifts. Oh, thank you. Yes, we've got exactly what we want. Eloquent words, sound knowledge. Paul says, well done. So then what I've then told you, he says then in verse 6, is that everything that I say confirms to you what I've said about Jesus Christ. Is that not true? They go, yes, Paul, it's absolutely true. Oh, thank you. It's almost using a form of flattery. 
But the underlying tone of that is, well then, if you're saying that's all true, and you like the idea that you've got eloquent words of knowledge, and I acknowledge that before you, then the rest of this letter is now true. So you better pay heed, because I am the apostle of Jesus Christ. It's quite subtle. I like it. So he then carries on. Now you have every spiritual gift you need as you eagerly wait for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. You lack nothing. You lack nothing, church. Greenford, we lack nothing. Good morning. We lack nothing. You have every gift that you need. Everything. And here for the Corinthian church, he's saying, so what are you doing with them? Oh, you're waiting for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, are you? So what are you doing in between time? This is not some social club. You're God's own possession. He's talking to the Corinthian church here. Excuse me. Let me reiterate. I'm not having a go at Greenford. But if you feel God talking to you right now, that's fine. But he's saying, but you've got everything. So who are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Why? Don't sit and on. Get on with it. Notice, as I said to you, not once here has he thanked them for what they're doing with what they've got. You're eagerly waiting for the return of our Jesus Christ. And then doing nothing then. For Paul, there's always a bigger picture. Something I want to show in this moment, this seven, the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. We say it so often, don't we? Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. Amen. But in the NLT, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but in the NLT, the translation is not quite right. It should be more revealed. That Jesus is going to be revealed. A revealing of who Jesus really is. The Corinthian church seems to have got wrapped up and limited who Jesus is. Limited about why they're here. Why God's chosen them as their own possession, as his own possession. Why they are present. They've limited that to almost, ah, I've been forgiven for my sins. I'll sit on my backside and I won't do anything else until he returns. But here with Paul, he's going, but Jesus Christ will be revealed who he is in all his glory. Every tongue will confess and every knee will bow. Yes? This has some reminiscence of some of Paul's teaching in Romans, where he says, the day of God's wrath, his righteous judgment will be revealed. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with blazing fire and with his powerful angels... Our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. That's quite big. So don't sit on your gifts. There's a bigger picture. Jesus is bigger. When Jesus is revealed, you realise how big he really is. Now, I can't believe this this morning, and I'm sorry, Hannah, but we sang that song, I am a friend of... Which is right and true. But the problem is, Jesus is not our bested bud. He's not our boyfriend. I can't say he's not our girlfriend for the men because clearly Jesus was male. But he's not any of those. He's not, to be honest with you, Jesus is not warm, cuddly and fuzzy. Oh, he's loving and he loves us clearly, but he's not our bested bud. Get the term. He's so much more than that. He is a true friend. Friend today, that term friend is used far too loosely in our society. Yeah? A true friend lays down their life for you. A true friend wants the very best for you. A true friend is centered around you and you around them. That's a true friend. And that's who Jesus modeled to be a true friend. Amen? Okay. But he's not your bested bud. He's not somebody you can just go, oh, I can take it or leave it. I'll decide to text him now or later. 
Facebook friends are not friends. I'm sorry. I do apologise. They might be mates, and there might be people you vaguely know, and there might be a couple of your true friends who are on your Facebook page with you, but they're not friends in the term that we see biblically. So when it's, we do talk about Jesus being our friend, it is not bested bud. There is something very much about him needing to be revealed. And the Corinthian church seems to have got laid back and forgot who Jesus was and why they are God's own possession. So this whole section is about Paul saying, well, you're God's own possession. You're gifted by God. So you need to live that out. You're gifted by God. You are, sorry, you are God's own possession. You're gifted by God. And when Jesus is revealed to you, you better have lived out that life. And later on in a few chapter times, there's a section about you will be saved. He's very made it very clear. You will be saved. But a few chapters time, we're going to see that it uses the phrasing that you will be saved. You're like someone who's just about escaped the flames. If you're not using that to which God has given you. You know, Jesus will come in judgment. We do have to sit before the judgment seat of Christ. I know we don't like that section. That one verse seems to make us very scared. But when you look at rest of Paul's teachings, there is clearly something very glorious about Jesus that makes him so much more than just our bested bud. So when you sing that song, I am a friend of God, fantastic. But recognize what that means to be a friend of someone. You're centered around them and they are centered around you. Verses 8 to 9. He will keep you strong to the end so you will be free from all blame on the day when our Lord Jesus Christ returns. God will do this for he is faithful to do what he says. And he has invited you into partnership with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Status confirmation again. He will save you. He will do it all. You are God's own possession. Amen? Amen? He will do all of this. And what's the amazing thing is, because you're God's own possession, it means he's called you into partnership with him. Have you ever considered that? You're called into partnership with Jesus to bring about God's glory and God's salvation plan for creation. Who's in a partnership? And I'm not talking about marriage so much, but like, who like works for a company? Does anybody work for a company? No? Okay, nobody? I do. I work for Greenford Baptist Church. We're not the largest conglomerate in the world, but we got the biggest boss. I didn't practice. That just came off the tip of my tongue, actually. <laughs> Carol, I don't practice half of my stuff. So, okay, so we got... So we do work, but when you work for somebody, you work for a company with values and goals and whatever else, yeah? But you don't feel particularly called into partnership with them. You don't feel you can actually be actively fully involved in all the things. But Jesus has actually asked you to partner with him in bringing about God's salvation plan for the whole of creation. Get the bigger picture. So when you wake up tomorrow morning thinking, right, got to go to work, got to go to college, school, meet some friends, do some housework, whatever your social situation is at the moment, part of that is actually, a chunk of all of that, that is covered by the fact I am called into partnership to be part of God's salvation plan for creation. Not a mediocre life in my head. Is it in yours now? So why are you sitting on your gifts? Get up and use them, Corinthian church. Let's carry on. Verse 1, 10 to 17. I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in your church. Rather be one of mind, united in thought and purpose. For some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels, my dear brothers and sisters. 
Some of you are saying, I am a follower of Paul. Others are saying, I follow Apollos, or I follow Peter, or I follow only Christ. Has Christ been divided into factions? Was I, Paul, crucified for you? Were any of you baptized in the name of Paul? Of course not. I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, for now no one can say that they were baptized in my name. Oh yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus, but I don't remember baptizing anyone else. For Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the good news, and not with clever speech, for fear that the cross of Christ would lose its power. So here we go. He's built them up nicely, and the first telling off. But notice how he does it. I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, Paul, if you look in all his letters, is very relational. He actually has great affection in his letters. That dear brothers and sisters. He's not lording it over them. He's saying, I am a brother and sister with you in Christ. I appeal to you affectionately, dear brothers and sisters. But he does also then say, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. I am your brother and sister in Christ, but I'm also given the God-given role as the leader. So I'm telling you this now in the authority that Jesus has given me. See the difference? And the reason he's saying that's two things. A, I love you and I'm doing this because it's for God's best and your best, but you need to listen to me because I'm doing it in the God-given role that I've been given by Jesus. So it's not lording it over them, but he recognizes the authority that he has. You with me? So it's a balance. He is trying to be loving and kind. He's not just telling them off, but he's recognizing that he needs to do that. Now, I've got to genuinely say, whenever I talk in passages where it talks about leadership and and authority-given leadership, and this is the interpretation of the Bible, I do recognize that being pastor of the church, and any most leaders should recognize, that it's very difficult sometimes in your own home church to be sitting here saying this. But that's the interpretation, and that's part and parcel of the package. So we always say, go away and read the Bible for yourself to see if we are misleading you. Paul's primary concern, and any church leader should be like this, is love of the other person. That is why they're doing it. But nonetheless, the authority is there and must be acknowledged because the leader is trying to do it for the the other person's best and the church as a whole and therefore then God's kingdom as a whole. Are you with me? Excellent. Putting it bluntly, the church here at Corinth were an immature lot. Hi, Corinthians. No, I'm joking. I am kidding. Some of the members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels. Oh, isn't that awful? Chloe, we're not quite sure who Chloe is, but we're assuming she's somewhere a member within the Corinthian church. And it could have been maybe a house staff have gone to Paul to deliver something and then saying, do you know, there is so much quarreling going on over there at the moment, Paul. It is unbelievable. Really, really bad. They're not doing very well. We've got some of them saying that they're a follower of you. Others... Apollos, others, Peter. Some say they'll only follow Christ. It's almost that sort of thing that I like this. It's um, because you can imagine the factions, couldn't you? You've got this one lot over here saying, oh, that Apollos, I love him. He's a great speaker. We know that from Acts chapter 18. He's brilliant. He's just such a wonderful, he's got an eloquent way with him. He's so well spoken. He knows how to keep us engaged. Oh, he's brilliant. I want to follow Apollos because he knows how to talk well. He talks like they do in Corinth. And then you've probably got another bunch over the other side going, oh, yeah, and that Paul, he's not very good at his talking. He, he sounds a bit wimpy, really, when he speaks. But do you know something? He did start the Corinthian church here, and he had that experience with uh, Jesus on the road to Damascus. I'm going to follow him. He's much better to follow than that Apollos. And then you've probably got a whole bunch of the Corinthian church over going, yeah, yeah, but I much prefer that Peter. Do you know why? Jesus said he's going to build his church on him. That's who I want to follow, the very man who's going to actually 
Christ is going to build his church on him. Isn't that good? And then you'll go to the other lot who say, I only follow Christ. Don't they sound good? Yeah, they say they're following Jesus, yes? Now, I used to read that and used to think to myself, oh, wow, they're a good bunch. They believe in following Jesus. And that's all they're worried about. They're interested in Jesus only. But do you know what that actually means? And I didn't, I'll be up front, I didn't know this. Those that say, I only follow Christ in the Corinthian church are those that are saying, I do not recognize the authority of the leadership in the church. I will totally and utterly ignore the God-given authority they've got. I only listen to what Christ tells me to do. Sorry? Yeah. That's fine. I'm quite used to that. Thank you, Pastor David. Or I'll listen to the bits that the church leaders tell me that I like, but I'll ignore the bits I don't like. And that's what that's about. And when there's clear instructions here throughout the whole of the Bible that God has always put human leaders in authority to care, to love, and to do the other things as well, unfortunately, like rebuking and whatever else, in the authority of Jesus, out of love, in leadership. So when I read these four, I always sit there going, oh, gosh, they're following those three. But the ones that follow Christ, they're doing all right. But actually, no, they're probably, in one way, actually the worst out of the four. But they're causing factions. And I don't want to hang on to that for too long. And they're causing a massive amount of factions within the church, all four of them. And Paul is saying, has heard this report. He must be absolutely appalled. You can see that very clearly. And I've got to say, why would you want to say I'm following Paul or I'm following Apollos or Cephas or, or, or whatever else when your identity is in Christ? Your identity is in Christ. You should follow whatever leader God here for Paul is saying has put in place. And then he comes to this question, which is fantastic. Has Christ been divided into factions? What's the answer? That should be the answer, but that's not the reason he's asked the question. Paul is saying, actually, Corinthian church, Christ is divided. You are currently dividing Christ. You are the body of Christ, yes? Yeah, it's all right, Corinthians, us, whatever. We are the body of Christ, yes? Okay, let's apply it to us a little bit. If we divide into factions, we've actually divided the body of Christ. We split them up. We've absolutely ruin himself in Matthew 12 25 it says every kingdom divided against itself will be review be ruined yes and that passage normally relates when they're talking about Satan oh Jesus is casting out um, these demons in Beelzebub's power and he's saying well a kingdom divided against itself will fall so Paul's using that same sort of imagery here and saying well actually you are divided because you're broken up into these factions so you have divided Christ. Christ is no longer united in the city of Corinth. And that's why he goes into this thing. Were any of these leaders crucified or baptized? Was Paul crucified for you? No, Jesus was. Don't get caught into factions. So basically, it's a sense of grow up recognize your identity in Christ and therefore the church body and be part of that body together and he carries on through the letter you can see why the primary people think the primary reason for this letter was about unity and unity only but it is so much more this in verse 16 I just want to hang on this because there's something about the fact I like this verse. It shows, for want of a better phrasing, the humanity of the Bible. If you ever wanted proof that the Bible was God-breathed through humans, here we have it. This, do you remember we said when you read the letters, you have to be almost like on the other end of the telephone conversation? trying to decipher what's going on. I, for this, I read this, and I've got this moment going on where Paul's going, 
and he's chatting away and he's, he says, yes, some of you are saying I'm a follower of Paul. Others say I'm Apollos. Oh, I thank God I did not baptize any except for Crispus and Gaius. And, and from now on, they can only say they were baptized in my name. And you've got sort of almost, you've got Stefan standing there going, why oh, he's on the phone. Hang on a minute. What? Oh, yes, okay, yes, yeah, yeah, I baptised the household of Stephanus, but I don't remember anything else. I've got that imagery going on in my head. If it was a mobile phone, it'd be gone. You can tell what happens in my house. So, that's the sort of imagery he got, and I love the humanity of that moment when he just suddenly dawns on him. But what Paul's trying to get at, it's really unimportant who baptised you. It's really quite unimportant who you think you should be following as a leader. You're God's own possession so who you should be following is God you should be hiding your identity in them not worrying about whether I Paul baptized you or not I baptized you in Christ and that's the point he's really trying to so I can imagine on the other end of the phone he's going excuse me a minute listen I'm trying to tell them not to worry about who's baptizing. It's irrelevant. Would you please stop reminding me? This is not the important point of the message. The important point I'm trying to get across is that they're God's own possession. Yes, hi. I've forgotten. Hi, welcome back. Do you get the point? <laughs> Paul really is finding this unimportant for him. And he says then in this verse 17, For Christ didn't send me to baptise, but to preach the good news, and not with clever speech, for fear that the cross of Christ would lose its power. Remember, Corinth is impressed by speakers with clever rhetoric and speech skills, speech skills which clearly I have not got. It was something that they highly sought after. It was part of their, their city. They literally flocked. If a great orator turned up, they flocked in droves. There's a, a, a part, uh, historical uh, material to know that actually they did. They literally hang outside these people's homes or inns, wherever they were staying. Couldn't wait to hear from them. Were desperate. They're almost like the one direction of today. Those lyrics have such deep meaning. <laughs> I've never listened to a song, so I haven't got a clue. So I better retract that. I do not mean One Direction specifically, but anybody of today who people fan after, people who think are great. The stars of today, the politicians today, those ones who have got great words, but they don't have any real substance behind them. I'm not saying that's true of all our politicians and all our, please hear me carefully, but you understand what I'm getting at. And they enjoyed this great, clever speech. But what Paul is saying, and he says that I don't speak very well. He comes out with that later on. But he's saying that's fine. Because I don't want my great skills of rhetoric speaking and wonderful, skillful speech to actually override what God wants to do. It will remove the power of the cross. It will remove the power of the gifting that I've been given, but it's not that. It will also actually remove just more than that. It will remove actually what Christ has done on the cross if you fall into that trap. The church wanted people who clearly spoke really well, who almost would match up to the eloquent philosophers that were outside of the church. So they, well, they would look good. They've fallen into that trap. So actually, as a church, if you're then saying, oh, we want exactly the same. We want our speakers and whatever else to be able to speak really eloquently, not fall over their words, have fantastic rhetoric, keep people's attention. You're saying what Christ did on that cross is not good enough. What Christ did on that cross is not good good enough unless I've been well trained in skillful speech excellent rhetoric what Christ has done is not good enough I need Christ on the cross and something else do you see the so let's apply that to us who 
else does this remind you of in the Bible? Paul later on talks about how he isn't very good eloquently with his speech. I come with much fear. Moses. What did Moses say? Oh, I can't do that, Yahweh. Oh, I'm not good of speech. Get my brother to do it instead. And he kept arguing. It's what made me laugh. And then God says, what did God say? Who gave you your mouth? So let's apply it to ourselves today. When you're with your work colleagues, friends, family, whatever else, is there sometimes a way that says, oh, I can't talk about the gospel to somebody. I'm not very good. I stumble over my words. I foul up. It, it won't have the power and impact that maybe Steve does it. I, Steve the evangelist in church. Oh, that's his thing. He's got that. I can't do that when I'm talking to somebody else. I haven't quite got it. I stumble over my words. I, I fumble around. I, I, I trip over my speech. I'm not very good at doing it. I need a bit of training in that, in, in telling my story. Goodness me, I stand up here. I trip over my words lots of times. But you still seem to understand me. That's good. But it's not about that. When you are giving the gospel to someone, when you are talking to them about Jesus, it's your story and your relationship with him, isn't it? So who's the best person to tell somebody else about your relationship with Jesus and your story about how you came to him? Who's that? Who, sorry? It's yourself. Nobody else can do it. You don't have to have fantastic speech. You don't have to know what is the right words to say. God will give them to you. As and when is necessary. Steve is not always the perfect person. Go and talk to somebody else. Don't. Leave him alone. I tell you, Steve cracks me up. I did never know. It's the day that we walked into a fish and chip shop. We literally walked in through the entrance and to the person behind the fish and chip shop, he said, do you know Jesus Christ yet? And the guy says, no. And he said, why not? <laughs> hey, don't knock it. I bet you. Okay, go on then. Stick your hands up. You're brave enough to do that because I most certainly ain't because I went, oh my giddy on. <laughs> but the best person to tell somebody else their story is You. So, but then when you sit there and think, oh no, I'm not very good at this, you're removing what Christ can do through you. You're saying Christ crucified and the gifts he's given me and the mouth he's given me that I've got is not good enough. Yet Paul is talking to the Corinthians saying, you've got it all already. And earlier on, you all said, amen to when I said, you've got the lot. You're not lacking anything. So we should be out there not worrying about, oh, is my language right? Because it might be right for that moment, for that person, at that time. In your weakness, I am strong. All of this, at this moment, is actually identity affirming. You are God's own possession. Therefore, it's not your own learning or your own strength that you need to rely on. But it's Christ's spirit in you because you are God's own possession. And Paul goes on about this quite a bit. I'm going to flash through this next lot. Because A, I've spoken on it before, but B, it gets picked up a lot as we go through. Or else I will assure you, we will be on this letter for the next two years, I think, at the rate we're going. Which is on one level I have no problem with. It, with. Might take us two years to all recognise we're God's own possession, amen? amen? And it might take the rest of us a lifetime. No, no, we're not amen to that. Because the idea is we're meant to... The amen, the amen is that we're meant to be living out the fact we're God's own possession. Doing well. 
So the message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. As the scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. So where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars and the world brilliance debaters? God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish. Since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom, he has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven, and it is foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended, and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. But to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. This foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans, and God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful in the, or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose those sorry, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. God made us right with God. He made us pure and holy and he freed us from sin. Therefore, as scriptures say, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. That says so much in that passage that I could sit here and we could break it down, but it actually says it all for itself. And as I said, it will get broken down and, and split up as further and further we go on the, on, along in the letter. But I do just want to make a few things. Firstly, we're all fools. Amen. Thank you. We're all fools. Uh, sorry, are you chosen by God? Yes. Then you're a fool. We're all fools. And that's great. Because if we're foolish, we rely upon God. And this last bit. God has united you with Christ Jesus for our benefit. God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy, and he freed us from sin. Let's redo that again. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy, and he freed us from sin. We've got another three minutes Unless I get a loud enough amen. Christ made us right with God. Amen. He made us pure and holy. Amen. And he freed us from sin. Amen. Thank you. You're God's own possession. I want us to walk out with that again today. Unless you're a member of the church, you've got a members meeting. But I want you to walk out with the fact that you are God's own possession. He has made you holy. He has freed you from sin. You haven't done any of it. I've done none of it. God has done that. All that you did was go, yes, I accept you as my, as my Lord and Saviour. When you realise the truth. When probably some other fool told you. Takes a moment and it sink in, yeah? <laughs> a fool told me and a fool like me is telling others. But that's fine. Because in Christ we are not foolish. Because we are God's own possession. So I walk out with that this morning. We follow Christ. We follow everything he's taught us. Everything he's established. 
We are God's own possession. Let's pray. Yeah, Lord, it is true when Peter wrote that some of the things that Paul writes are hard to understand. And sometimes it takes some real unpacking and some real looking at. But Lord, we thank you for the wisdom of your spirit. We thank you for those that you have gifted in scholarly work who are able to help unpack your word. And Lord, we thank you for your spirit when we are listening and speaking, that we know that you speak through us and speak to us. But Lord, more importantly, you do it because we are your possession. You love us. You want the very best for us and you want us to be part of your kingdom. I ask that each and every one of us here will have a change from last week to this week to next week. We will get how much we are your own possession and how much you want us to partner with you in your salvation plan. In the name of Jesus, amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.